So my company is Theraspects, and I always thought I was going to start a software company. Uh, it was my ambition. Um, but what we do is we manufacture eyewear that helps with migraines, headaches, eye strain, and other issues that could be worsened or triggered by light. And I got into that for very personal reasons. It sort of blindsided me as an opportunity and as something that needed to be done. On the coaching side, I started originally doing my coaching and consulting really just to pay the bills while I was starting a company, um, but I have become more and more engaged with it. I really enjoy it. Um, and transitioning from as you know, product managers turning into CEOs, there's nothing that makes you know what you really believe as far as business principles, like spending your own money. Um, and so it really focused my mind, and through all of that, right, since the very beginning, and as I started to, uh, especially uh, my last job that I actually held, I was the VP of product for a company, and was trying to really realize, or trying to think through how we made great stuff, because this company had made some great stuff, and it made some not great stuff, and in my career, I had made some great stuff and some not so great stuff, you know, on the scale. And so when I started to learn about some of the methodologies that were out there and really coming up, and Lean Startup is the rubric that people talk about a lot, um, it resonated with me. It hit me with a light, like a lightning bolt. And I'll talk a little bit about the specifics um, that, uh, that really hit me as I go through this. So I'm going to talk about Lean Startup in the context of innovation games, because that's why we're here. But before I start, I want to talk about Lean Startup in general. It's a full-on buzzword, 100% status word now, right? And so everybody has a different understanding of what this is and has their preconceived notions. So I'm going to tell you what's actually, what it actually is, or OK, what I think it is. Um, but uh, this is the way I look at it. So when Eric Ries wrote his book, when you really read it, there are three legs to the Lean Startup stool. Uh, the first is Lean Methodologies. This is where the word Lean comes from. This is Toyota production system type stuff. This is uh, continuous improvement, limiting work in progress, reducing waste, and so on. Now, in the book, he talks a lot about fast-to-market platforms, specifically because he's a software guy. And this actually sometimes gets translated when you read about this as use open source or free software. But that's just one implementation of the philosophies behind Lean. The second stool to Lean Startup is agile methodologies for development, Scrum, XP, and so on. Um, more and more, these are being adopted by non-software companies. But again, the, these two go together, right? Agile methodologies were developed because the, the people who developed them were studying lean methodologies and brought that over. And then the third leg to the lean startup stool is customer development. This came from Steve Blank, Four Steps to the Epiphany, Startup Owner's Manual. And this is applying the same iterative ideas that are in these other two, but specifically to learning about your customers. And when people talk, when people say lean startup, almost always what they actually mean is, customer development. They're talking about that experimental process of actually getting out of the building and figuring out what your customers actually need, rather than just depending on what you think is going on. So what Eric wrote about was really zooming in on this. And he, he boiled it down to, you got some ideas, and you build some product. You put that product out in the world, and you measure what happens with it, which generates data. You use that data to learn, and that gives you new ideas, and around the loop you go. The biggest sticking point here is the word product. You build product. In Eric Reese's world, this made a lot of sense. He was already in market, and this is how they iterated to success. But I like the original language that Steve Blank had, which is that you have a hypothesis, and you build an experiment. And eventually, that experiment may be a product, because that's the best thing that you can have in market right now to learn and reduce the risk that you have. But it's rarely the first thing that you want to do. So and this is used at all venture stages. This is the other thing. Um, as Blank talked about it, two phases, search and execute. And you move through, and you actually have separate iterative phases as you learn about your customers, and then you build the product, and then you, and then you go on. And these have lots of names. So crawl in uh, uh, Lean Analytics, empathy, empathy, stickiness, virality, revenue, and scale. I really like just the simple uh, Ash Morias in running Lean. You First, you're investigating. Do I understand the problem, and will my solution actually do this, what we think it will for the customer? Then once you know that that has fit, you move on to product market fit. Right? I, I've got something in market. Now, is it working? Can it continue to work? And when you're really confident that's going, you move on to scale. The other thing is, though, that this can happen with existing products as well. This isn't just new products. I've got a new version of Photoshop coming out. And as Luke said somewhere, like it's, Photoshop can't pivot. But Photoshop can absolutely go out and make sure that they understand the problems and the solution fit and move from that. The common pattern among all this is it's not the traditional metrics that you're using to measure yourself. It's not your measurement dates or your revenue or everything. It's how much have you learned? How much do you know? And the corollary that goes along with this as you go through time is you're lowering risk. 
And the core thing here is that what you're doing is you're scaling your investment as your risk falls. So early on, you're spending as little as possible to understand what's going on in the world, right? You're not building the product. And eventually, the best thing to do to, to determine whether people are actually going to buy your thing is to build your thing. That's way down the line. And this sounds really logical and obvious, but that's not the way almost every product has been built in the history of all products. Right? Either you're a startup, and I've got this great idea, and I can pitch it super well, and so I find somebody else, and I pitch to them, and they believe me, and they give me money, and I go and I build it, or the same thing happens inside a big organization. I have an idea, I pitch my VP or my boss's 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 boss, he likes the idea or she likes the idea, they write me a check, they fund the team, and off I go. So this is one of the main things that, uh, that the literature really talks about, but there's something else that I really think is valuable here, and it's the way we think. This is an example of this before I get started. Um, how many animals of every type did Moses take on the ark? Zero. Noah took animals on the ark. This is the way our brains work all the time. Moses fits the biblical theme. We don't even notice that it's not the right word. We answer the question. We don't even know that we didn't understand the question. So uh, Kahneman wrote a book uh, called Thinking Fast and Slow, where he described that we have two thinking systems. The first thinking system is fast, pattern matching to what we already know and expect. This is how you can walk into a room and know what the mood of the room is. Is everybody in this room angry, or is everybody in this room jovial? You don't have to take an inventory of faces. You just know. Your pattern matching sets in. Our second system is our slow, logical, effortful system. This is what we actually think of as ourselves, our rational selves. This is how we can do calculus and make marketing reports and use spreadsheets and do all sorts of other things. The trick is that system one is kind of running the show by default, because system two only kicks in when system one says, hey, this doesn't match pattern, or I know this pattern says that I need to use logic here. So stuff is flowing past our desk all the time, past our minds all the time, and we are making decisions about it, and we don't realize we're even making the decisions. So what I see as the lean startup in this philosophy of meshing all of these iterative loops together, remember, three legs of the stool, meshing all these iterative loops together is, it's a way to consciously engage your system too. You know that every stage, you're actually turning on that part of your brain, right? Especially in the most important part of your brain, or part of the process, which is, should we build this thing? 80% right is way more than 20% wrong. Should we build this thing? Let's not just use our pattern matching systems and move on. So the customer development mantra, as many of you know, is there are no facts inside the building. And this is an incredibly powerful thing to start to actually absorb. The CEOs, what the CEO says to do is a fantastic hypothesis. And I'm sure you're going to go test that one first, because it's the CEO. But it's just a hypothesis. The only opinion that actually matters is your customer. Right? Now, you can leave the building uh, metaphorically or physically. And the other thing is that, as Luke pointed out actually during one of our trainings, there are constraints inside the building. So you have to be aware of those. But when you're leaving the building, what are you doing? Well, this is where we get into the meat of it. Because the, the meat of the idea of Lean Startup is that you're running an experiment. Right? We'll talk a little bit about what forms an experiment, but there are a bunch of different kinds of experiments that are written about now. And I'm going to show you a grossly simplified chart. In fact, this is a kind of embarrassing, but it, hopefully it'll get the idea across. In much of the literature, like in Lean Startup itself, there's a real focus on the MVP, the minimum viable product. You have something in market as soon as possible that people are buying and choosing to use or not to use. And this is fantastic because it gives you incredibly high confidence data. If somebody actually buys something from you, or even more, if somebody actually spends their hours using the thing, it's a pretty good indication that you're building the right thing, and you can really decide how to move forward from there. There's also some talk about what I've uh, heard of as a concierge MVP, although the phrase I just learned was Wizard of Oz MVP, where you actually have something which to the customer looks like a finished product, but it's not. Somebody's behind the strings, the scenes pulling the strings. And my favorite ex example of this is um, Coinstar machines. You know, the machines in the front of grocery stores, you dump your change in and it gives you gift cards or whatever. They had faced a big decision. They were trying to decide whether or not they were actually going to do their tooling. And so what they did is they built a box, and the guy sat on a stool in a box in a real grocery store and fed the money out the slot when people put the change in the box. Right? They saved millions of dollars in tooling until they were sure 
that, they, that somebody would actually lug that big jug of change back to the grocery store. That's a huge barrier to entry for them. But even still, that confidence comes at high, uh, low speed and high cost. This is not something that makes a lot of sense to do first, right? You're not down that risk curve yet. So then you move on to more things, functional prototypes, where it's just a little bit of something, and maybe I'm taking it out and I'm showing it to my customer, and they're poking at it and giving me feedback. Well, this is better. It's a lot cheaper and faster than doing the full MVP, but your confidence goes down because now I've got the question of, well, how is it presented? Did the customer actually conceive of the thing that's going to be completed the same way I do? Do they think it's more or less? Right? Or there's landing pages. Now, this is actually fast and easy. This is the idea where build a web page for a product that doesn't exist yet, and then buy traffic to send to it and see if anybody clicks the buy button or signs up, shows any real world interest. This is actually one of my favorite experiments. I, I, don't get me wrong. But the thing here is, especially early on, am I even asking for the right thing? How do I even know what the value proposition is I'm throwing up on this page is, and I have confidence in that? Um, do I, when the experiment is over, do I have confidence that I got lucky? Or if it fails, do I have confidence that I was even asking the right question? So I can't walk away to it from a failed experiment. And if I can't walk away from a failed experiment, the value of that experiment is much lower. So then we get into surveys and interviews, right? These are classic, and as Luke says, surveys suck. Um, surveys are actually fantastic to quantify, to get your um, uh, statistically valid results to make sure that, that the other stuff that you've done is there. But so many people start there, and your confidence should be almost zero that if you're starting with a survey. And interviews, again, I love interviews and I use interviews a lot, but you have to know that, that if the person who's interviewing doesn't have a lot of skill, there's a lot of bias in there, but even more, surveys and interviews have low confidence simply because when you bring them back inside the organization, nobody believes them. So it doesn't matter how good you actually were, unless you are actually the ordained customer research person for your organization, it's not gonna go anywhere. And this is why I think of innovation games as the secret weapon. Because they really, in my mind, they combine the speed and cost advantages of interviews and surveys, but have so much higher confidence, both when you're running them and when you bring them back into the organization. And there are a few reasons for that. There's an outstanding cost to learning ratio. You can do these games really inexpensively compared to, again, building an MVP and learn so much, as we've heard in the previous two uh, 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 talks about just how much volume can, be com can come out of this. There's much lower bias for inexperienced researchers because the structure of the games and the rules themselves um, make sure that you're framing it, and the interaction between your customers actually generates information for you rather than bias against you. They're more likely to uncover unknown unknowns than any of those other experiment types that I talked about. Right? Surveys can do it, but you can't really count on that happening. But innovation games, I've yet to play a set of innovation games where somebody didn't say, I had no idea that was going on. Um, it convincingly counters uh, you know, the quote from Henry Ford, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have just asked for a faster horse. This is the co most common objection that I've heard inside of organizations to doing this kind of experimentation at all. And the thing about an innovation game is that the visceral nature of the feedback, as Luke said, the pictures of the artifacts you know, nobody thinks that what you did was walk in and ask for what they wanted, right, in this open-ended question. They know exactly how you went about that. And then finally, the games are varied, and so they're applicable, right? Remember I showed you those four stages that Steve Blank did? There are games to be played at every one of those stages, and in fact, I could probably argue that every one of, those game, every one of the innovation games could be played for one reason or another at every one of those stages. And that means that your team, your organization, you're building muscle that you can keep using and keep using and keep using and keep using. Right. So, okay, we've all run innovation games, or most of us are at least familiar with innovation games. What makes an innovation game an experiment? Because right. it's not immediately an experiment. And I will clarify, I don't think that every innovation game that everybody needs to run needs to be an experiment. But if you're thinking in this way and you want an innovation game to be an experiment, well, they require a falsifiable hypothesis. That's the definition of an experiment in this world. Right? If you can't falsify what came out of it, you can have confirmation bias, you don't really know what you're going to get, you don't know whether or not you're satisfied with the answer that you just received. So how do you form a hypothesis? Well, the most basic hypothesis format in the lean literature is some specific and repeatable action will result in some measured expected outcome. Right? Concrete. Not Blog posts will drive signups, but 
a guest blog post of 300 words for blog X will drive 10 signups or more. The first one, I have no idea if it was false after it was over. The second one, I know exactly if it was false or true after it was over. I like an expanded format that really draws this out. I or we believe something, some declarative statement. And we'll know this to be true when something or went false when something. And the false line is great because it actually forces you to sit down and think about what would convince me? What would convince other people? What are the people in the room that I'm going to have to convince later going to think? Let, let's actually construct our hypothesis as we're going through this. So these are some really <laughs> rough experiment uh, hypothesis for innovation games, just as examples. Um, so something like uh, running speedboat with personal trainers will result in 75% identifying client schedule management as their number one or number two anchor. Right? We really believe that's true. We're going after this thing. So let's run speedboat and see if this comes up. This is, by the way, this is a really hard experiment because speedboat is open-ended. So we have no idea what's going to come out. So I have really high confidence that this is, a, this is true. Um, something like uh, buy a feature, telecommuters playing buy a feature with our MVP feature set will result in VoIP calling being purchased in all of our games. Or an extended format, um, we believe amateur multi-copter buyers value their drones as camera accessories. That's how they conceive of them. We'll know this to be true when photography features are central to 80% or more of product pitches, or, but we'll know this to be false when photography is central to fewer than 50% of pitches, or more than two product boxes don't reference photography at all. I use this as an example. One of the reasons I like this format is that oftentimes your verified uh, condition and your falsified condition are not symmetrical. There's a higher bar in many cases to be sure that you've actually verified. Right? But if this happens, if, hey, if half the product boxes don't have photography as central, and if more than one person actually says, doesn't even mention photography, then this hypothesis is not true. OK, um, just to wrap up, right, the, the, or to start to close on this, there are some potential pitfalls with using uh, innovation games as experiments. But these are the same pitfalls that you get in most qualitative research. And as I said, it's easier to manage them, I think, in innovation games than in most of the qualitative research. So having a hypothesis can really bias the facilitator of any of these games, and even the observers. If it's at all possible, I recommend the facilitator can know a lot about the shape of your business and what you're going and what you're hoping to learn, but hide the actual hypothesis from that person, if you can, if it's possible to. I think that it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, to manage the game. Then the other two are similar. Um, you can get ambiguous results if you didn't frame your hypotheses well. This is something that comes out from almost all qualitative research, but again, you can manage that. It's something to be thinking about. And uh, again, something Luke pointed out when we were talking about this in, in our other workshop, it's really easy when you're doing quantified results for your hypotheses to mistake this for statistically relevant. Right? If 80% of people build my product box that I invited, that does not mean that 80% of my customer segment will something. Right? But lots of people could make that mistake and make that jump. This is the place where following up with a statistically significant um, research method, such as a validated survey, we spend a lot of time on who your survey population is, and all the other things you need to do can come into play. And finally, as I said, lots of games could be used at lots of stages, but this is just an example of how I start to think about this if I were looking at, 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 the, at the space. So when you're, at the problem, when you're looking for problem solution fit, right, you're generally looking for things which are a little more open-ended, you're trying to explore, you're verifying, you're understanding of the way that person runs their day, the problems they're encountering, and that brings out things like The Apprentice or um, Speedboat, but it also brings out, remember, the future and Hot Tub and Product Box where they're projecting what the world should look like. And I'll just uh, put in my little pitch for Start Your Day uh, after talking to Luke. Um, it's one, apparently, it's one of the less played games. And it was a sleeper for me. Um, I don't remember the reason I first played it, but uh, it's now one of my standards. And I've, ne I've yet to see something not come out of the rhythm of start your day that is, um, that's incredibly valuable, especially in that early stage when you're trying to understand what people are actually doing with their world. And then in the middle, right, you've got a product in market, the standard stuff, prune your product tree, buy a feature, product box, and in scale. Um, similar stuff as in product market, because you're actually in the scaling phases. But the thing to think about here is that this is also the place where a lot of the time the things you need to change and iterate aren't your actual concrete product anymore in, in when you're in scaling problems. There are other things internally, or there are other aspects around that. That's why I bring something like spiderweb back in, 
because now step back out, right, and examine how does your product fit into the new spider web now that it's actually in market and you're trying to scale. And show and tell, of course, because you've actually got something in market and they can bring it in and say, this is what's going on with what's, what's, um, what I'm working with. And my last comment is that uh, on the innovation game specifically is that when I really started this, I really thought of divergent games at the beginning and problem solution and convergent games at the end. And that's not true at all. That what we've found is that divergent, convergent, and sense-making games are applicable to all these stages because you're actually opening, making sense of your data, and closing your conclusions at each one of these stages, just you have a different criteria to close that window. And so I just say, right, the, the mantra is get out of the building, but let's get out of the building and let's play some games. Thanks, guys. Um, so thanks for giving a shout out to start your day. The moment you said that, Jennifer whipped her head around and looked at me and smiled. Why is that, Jennifer? Oh, I think it was um, just because we were, the start your day <laughs> <laughs> and we've been reluctant to play that one, but it, yeah, it's just great. I loved, I loved your presentation. <laughs> now we're playing all the games. Yeah. Oh, and I had the same thing. I was like, I don't know what's ever going to come out of this, but uh, let's try it because we didn't know what else to do to explore. For somebody who was really early stage, was trying to do some pivots, and um, and they got some really fascinating um, sort of behavioral cyclical models out that weren't, that weren't common, but what they did is they realized that every customer had their own cycle and they were all off cycle, which is why they didn't figure out that that was happening. It was really. OK, we have time for one question. If we have one question for Hart, Lean World. OK, Scott. I missed up front. I apologize. How does this fit into your? OK, so uh, back to um, I read Lean Startup in the tail end of my days of my last job. I started my own startup. I actually use these methods. So people also say that this is only good for software. I did this for an eyewear company. I had my own, proto well, I had my own prototype. I had moved on. Yeah, glasses. Um, and uh, I actually built a landing page. One of my last experiments was a landing page with my one prototype. I had literally one pair in the whole world. I built a landing page. I had all the stuff down there. I had a buy button at the bottom with a price on it. People clicked the buy button, and they got a, hey, we're actually in beta. Sign up for the email. But when I saw how many people could click it, um, I knew that I could start the business, that I should start the business. Since then, what I've done is really started to see how all of this fits together in the product management. And so while I use these methods extensively and continuously, so I'm still doing A-B testing on my website and all sorts of other uh, market tests for our new styles and things like that. Um, it's central to the coaching I do, specifically around product management, uh, trying to figure out how, basically, my hypothesis in the world that I'm doing in my consulting and coaching is that it used to be that the primary source of waste in almost all organizations was, can we build it and how do we build it? And that we've moved past that. We are so good at building stuff as a, as a world. We're so good at building stuff that the primary source of waste and risk is, should we build it? And, and not necessarily the whole thing, but this little widget and the, you know, this little piece of it and so on. And so uh, I really focus my efforts on working with all sorts of clients, including Adobe, on helping answer that question. Brilliant. Thank you so much.